Welcome to another episode on the Universe of Infinity from Corvus Belly. This episode is dedicated to the Invincibles. The second most powerful faction of the future is Yu Jing, the pan-Asian alliance forged in the economic gravity well of post-communist China. At the end of the 21st century, the Chinese policy of Jingji imperialism had seen the People's Republic consume most of its neighbors. The collapse of the United States allowed China to first subsume Japan, Korea, and Mongolia, before consolidating Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Nepal, Bhutan, Tibet, Cambodia, Taiwan, and portions of Russia. The party embarked on its own second cultural revolution synthesizing the storied past of its constituent neighbors and the authoritarian rule of the Communist Party to create its own new system. A legally selected emperor would sit on the throne to symbolize authority, power, and unification, while the party could continue to operate as it had for so long. With this new government, the Pan-Asian Alliance was renamed to Yu Jing, or Jade Capital. Although Yu Jing would go on to modernize its economic and political systems, the same could not be said of its military forces. Aside from its growing rivalry with Pan-Oceania, there were no real military threats that could spur modernization. The second space race had relatively little armed conflict. It was always cheaper to use bribes instead of bullets when Yujing needed something done. That was until the Neocolonial Wars. Forty-two years after the establishment of O-12, the supranational body that succeeded the United Nations, the military of Eugene looked more like the fighting force of the 20th century than the 22nd. Incidents on Svalarema and Varuna led to the lethal and destructive Neo-Colonial Wars. The first stage, referred to as the Meat Grinder, was largely contained to planetary fighting. The second phase of the war was dominated by the Shea, or Snake Offensive. Yu Jing had a superior navy, but utilized inferior strategic doctrine. Tactics that had been entirely based around numerical superiority were decades out of date. Most soldiers weren't even equipped with body armor, since the old guard party generals believed that it would have led to infantry growing soft. Although there were some high-tech forces present, like the Niao Zui or Birdbeak armored troops, they were inferior in quality and numbers to the juggernaut that was Pan-Oceania. The results were destructive and wasteful. A lull before the third phase allowed the defense minister, Tsang Huan, to embark on a massive program to revamp Yu Jing's armies. The main thrust of his argument, improve morale, survivability, and combat effectiveness by deploying legions of power-armored suits. They would never compare to the advanced materiel of Pan-Oceania, but they could be fueled at a fraction of the cost and with less demanding training. The result was the formation of the Invincible Army. This isn't a video on the Invincible Army as a whole, but that will come, eventually. For now, let's focus on the results of Tseng Huan's reforms, the Invincibles. They shouldn't be thought of as their own branch of the army, more like a corps. The way that the United States has airborne and armored corps throughout its different branches today, that can sometimes intermingle. There are three different Datuei honored with the title of Invincibles, though they're all trained similarly at Lake Tianqi on the capital world of Yutang. First, there's the beloved Shangji Invincibles. Their armor is lighter, more advanced, and faster than their Niao Zui predecessors. The name of the unit means superior, as in superior to all of their armor in the range. This fourth gen armor is reserved for the best troops in the corps, most of whom were taught by the veterans of the Neocolonial Wars from 25 years ago. Their gear is comparable to any other powered armor suite while also costing less. As production ramps up, the Ministry intends to eventually make the Shangji suit the standard issue for every trooper in the Invincible Army. Until then, they function as an elite auxiliary force. Second are the Zuyong Invincibles, the Terracotta Soldiers. They are named for the statues that guard the mausoleum of the Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, the unifier and founder of the Chinese Empire. Qin was the first to pursue an empire that encompassed all of China, and so too is the goal of the Zuyongs, unification. The Invincible Army is very explicitly a citizen's army, one that anyone can join regardless of imp background or training. There is no ethnic component to the Zuyongs. The Regional Dispersion Program allows entire regiments of autonomous or semi-autonomous forces comprising local groups that keep their own cultural and political norms. 
The result is that many units of the Invincibles have custom paint schemes based on their origin or purpose. However, when deployed, the Zuyong are the ultimate unifying force. Troops are presented with the iconic Terracotta Soldier Helmet, creating a sense of anonymity and unity within the whole. The main color of these troops is orange. In China, orange dye is made from saffron, and is the rarest and most precious color. It combines yellow, which symbolizes spirituality with red, symbolizing power. The result is orange, which represents metamorphosis and growth, which is perfect for the modernizing icon of the Terracotta Soldiers and the Invincible Corps as a whole. Finally, there are the Yanhuo Invincibles, which are the heavy fire support dadui of the Invincible Army. Their name means fireworks in Chinese, with characters for smoke and fire, although the latter can also mean rage or anger. Although bigger and equipped with heavier weaponry, the armor and training is actually very similar to that of the standard Zuyong to allow for maximum tactical flexibility. Now, there's not that much to say, really. They're Zuyong with different training to use bigger, flashier guns. The goals of the Invincibles are to tie the disparate ethnic groups that comprise Yujing together, as well as provide a supremely flexible fighting force. Thus far, they are succeeding with flying colors. There are more Invincibles than any other heavy infantry unit in the human sphere. The party floods Mayanet, the communications network, with propaganda, giving ethnic groups a sense of competitive spirit and ethnocentricity that also places Yujing above all other cultural ties. A fire team of Invincibles is a fearsome thing indeed. All of them are constantly trained with flexibility over specialization, which means you're just as likely to see an Invincible on guard duty as on the assault. This training generally happens at the Three Lakes complexes on Yutang, but they learn to fight in dozens of different environments. The San Sun Peninsula on Yutang contains the abandoned remnants of industrial buildings, tourist zones, and even farmland, all a casualty of the neo-colonial wars several decades earlier. If the Jianxie line troopers are there just to hold the line, then the Invincibles are there to push it. The entire purpose of the Invincible Army is to complete objectives, whatever the cost. Like all troops in the State Empire's military, Invincibles put a great focus on close combat. Servo-powered arms with crushing strength mean that even a knife or punch can break bone. When that's out of reach, Invincibles are still trained to use infiltration tactics to close the distance and make close-range weapons like shotguns and flamethrowers count. It is of the utmost importance that even though Invincibles are used in dangerous close-quarters battle situations, they're still just regular soldiers. These aren't special forces troops. Units are intermixed and deployed alongside elite spec ops formations, but sometimes they'll be used for civic duties like search and rescue or military police. Imagine how cool career day would be if uh, some kid's mom came in wearing orange-powered armor. There are three different types of armor used in the Invincibles. There's the Zuyong Type 3, the variant for the Anhuo, the Shangji Type 4, which is the most recent version, and there's also the earlier Birdbeak Type 2 armor, which was very expensive to develop. Elements of the armor are still used today with other regiments. The faceplate, for example, is still used by the Daofei bandits. Uh, as mentioned, all this armor is easy to use and comfortable to wear. The quality isn't perfect, but it doesn't need to be. Their weapons, however, are on par with those of their rivals. Considering that the Invincibles use basically every conventional weapon in Infinity, I won't run down the entire arsenal. So, here's a few of them. The Yanhuo, however, are one of just a few units that use the HMC, the Hyper Rapid Magnetic Cannon. It's a monster of a weapon that uses a rotating array of railguns, three barrels using electrically induced magnetism to accelerate a projectile at hypersonic speeds, and shoulder mounted for maximum mobility. They use 3mm shards, but with a kinetic energy superior to any conventional bullet. The Yonggang Jing Type 0.0 is a copy of the Switek Gurgis, uh, but I doubt that anybody thinks of it as a counterfeit when it's penetrating the walls of a bunker. The original Invincibles were one of the very early units made for Infinity, way back in the first edition. I still think they're pretty cool. The helmet design definitely set them apart from the Space Marines of contemporary miniatures companies. Corvus Belly has explained on their site that the original design was supposed to be very different from their Pano counterparts. While those big armored suits were aerodynamic and rounded, Yujing models were supposed to look archaic, like an ornate Chinese suit. But eventually they went for a different aesthetic. Lightweight, modern, and high-tech. They still have that very distinctive U-shaped shoulder pads that keep with the Chinese armor theme. 
In the first and second edition, they were explicitly listed as having foreign instructors from some other planets, but that seems to have been retconned out. Now they're homegrown killing machines instead of foreign trained ones. Cool. Starting from the second edition, we saw this shift from Invincibles to Shang-Chi Invincibles. And then when third edition rolled around in 2015, we finally saw the Invincible Army sectorial teased, and we slowly saw a trickle of new Zhu Yang models. The Anhuo also came out in third edition. First we got the multi-rifle model in the Red Veil starter box, then the HMG model in a blister pack. Finally, in 2018, we got the beautiful Invincible Army box set, which really opened up the range. I'll have to go back and do more info on the Invincible Army at some point, uh, because all the lore and models are fabulous. Well, unfortunately for the Shang-Chi, though, uh, it's still the only model of its line. Even though you can equip them with uh, flamethrowers, combi rifles, multi-rifles, and medikits, and hacking devices, and rocket launchers, there's still just this one second edition model. Now, I, I think it's a lovely sculpt, personally. It's, it's so cool that it's actually getting an action figure, but I eagerly await the rest of the line. It would have been really easy to make the Chinese faction the Zerg Rush, or Swarm faction. It would have also been stereotypical and kind of insensitive, too. I love that Corvus Belly flipped it on its head, with Yu Jing outnumbered by Pan Oceania and being forced to develop smaller numbers of elite troops to deal with a numerical disadvantage. Invincibles are thematic, cool, interesting, uh, I don't know, they just get two big thumbs up from me. Okay, so Shangji means superior, as in superior to other armor. Easy enough. Yan Huo means fireworks. Okay, and the symbols on its badge are the combination of the characters for fire and smoke. Pretty fun. What about these guys then? So the full unit name is given as Zhu Yong Invincibles Terracotta Soldiers. If you really squint, you can see that their logo is Zhu Yong Wu Di in Pinyin. So Zhu Yong probably translates to Terracotta Soldier, right? Nope. Uh, so Yong actually refers to funerary statues, like the individuals from the Terracotta Army. More on that in a second. And the Zhu sort of means a grunt or a servant. So Zhu Yong means tomb statue servant or something like it. So I don't know. I guess it does kind of mean Terracotta soldier, but um, cooler. Uh, so what do the other symbols on its badge mean? If you look really close, you can see Wu Di, which in this case kind of means without opposition. So um, I guess this means unmatched tomb servant, or I guess invincible tomb servant, or something like it. Uh, big thanks to the Eternal Rival blog, link in the description for explaining all of that. Uh, back to the Terracotta Army that I've mentioned a few times. You've probably heard of it. It's a massive collection of sculptures depicting um, the army of Qin Shi Huang dating back more than 2,000 years to the late 300s BCE. Uh, the army served as a metaphorical garrison for the first emperor of China, there's at least 8,000 statues there, including chariots and horses and cavalrymen. Uh, the entire necropolis, not just the statues, but the whole thing is an astonishing 98 square kilometers. That's 38 square miles. The thing is huge, and it's only partially excavated. The warriors were discovered in the 70s by a bunch of farmers who were digging a well. Most of them are still buried, by the way. The tomb itself hasn't been excavated. Honestly, reading about the terracotta army is really neat. It's a treat. I don't know. Go on YouTube, check out Wikipedia, get lost in a hole. It's pretty interesting stuff. So, there you go. A much meatier video on three units at once. All of them pretty interesting. This video was a lot more work than the last one, but it was still a lot of fun, and I hope to keep on pumping these out. At least through the launch of 4th edition. Right now I've got a growing list of units and topics to cover. Next week, I might take a break from the units and go look at a more basic element of the Infinity Universe. But I'm really eager to make more vids, so please, leave a comment below telling me why and what you want me to research, and uh, it'll go on the list. Until then, thanks for watching. See you soon!